Hey folks, happy new year. Of course, it's not New Year's yet as I sit here recording this, but I say Happy New Year because it will be, by the time you watch this, it's what's known as leading your shot. You like that? I learned that term because I was raised by people who hunted animals for sport. There's all kinds of interesting things you pick up when that's in your background. Anyway, so it's time for another Star Trek video. Of course, this isn't going to be one of those Star Trek videos where I try very hard, so it's not a... Trek actually, it's more of a not actually Trek actually, and this will be yet another one of those absolute bottom of the creative barrel comment response videos where I respond to some of the comments that viewers like you, and perhaps even some of you very viewers, have left on the most recent several Trek Actually and Not Actually Trek Actually videos that I've posted in the past couple of months, so let's get started right away, shall we? These first several comments were left on my most recent Trek Actually video, which was about Odo, produced in tribute to the recently departed Renea Bergenwald. This first one is from Ensign Black, who says, Great episode. Odo is one of my favorites. It's always bothered me, though, that no one has seemed ever to have met or heard of a changeling, despite there having been a species which did the same thing in Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country. Well, thank you for the comment there, Ensign Black. Several people left comments making a similar point, basically wondering whether Odo was actually the first being of his kind that we see in Star Trek. And I think you can fairly say that he was, because even though we have seen other shapeshifters in Star Trek produced before the start of Deep Space Nine, and, and Star Trek VI is a really prominent example where Martia, who helps uh, Kirk and McCoy escape from the Klingon prison camp on Ruripente, is a shapeshifter. She describes herself as a comaloid. And I think we have enough evidence on screen that we can conclude that a comaloid and a changeling are not the same thing. Remember that a changeling doesn't just change their shape but they have a default form that is like a gelatinous goo. Like the default form of a changeling is not any particular shape at all. They're sort of like, like a jelly that can assume multiple shapes. Whereas we don't see that with a comaloid. As far as we know, Martia's uh, appearance that she has for most of the movie is her default appearance. And she can change her shape to uh, to whatever she needs to change it to, whatever she needs to suit her, her given purpose. We don't see that her default shape is a bucket of goo, <laughs> like we see Odo. So it's possible and, and uh, established on screen, in fact, that there are other species throughout the Federation that we've seen pop up in other Star Trek productions that predate the introduction of Odo that are shapeshifters, that can change their appearance, but they aren't necessarily changelings. Changelings are a specific species that can not only change their shape, but they have a sort of shapeless default form. So I think that's the key distinction, and that's what allows us to say that Odo is the first of his kind, his kind being changelings or founders or whatever you want to call them, that we see in Star Trek. This next one is from My Magnificent Octopus, off topic, but the one thing that always bothered me about DS9 is that the other changelings are similarly bad with faces. As we see in Children of Time, after a while, Odo can mimic faces much better, and the other changelings can as well, since they mimic specific people throughout the series. So why do the changelings, when in humanoid form, but not mimicking someone specific, have the same imperfect faces as Odo? Wouldn't they be skilled enough to form ordinary faces of the humanoid species we see in the Gamma Quadrant? For that matter, why does Laz have the same face type as Odo? Wouldn't he too be better at faces, since he can go so far as to mimic fog and fire? I suppose you can say the Odo-like face is some sort of default form, but that doesn't make much sense, since their default form is liquid. It just seems odd all changelings we meet have the same poorly formed face. Obviously, it is there for narrative convenience to tell us who is a changeling, but logically it makes no sense they would decide, when emulating humanoids, but not any specific one, to have the same imperfect face as Odo has. You've got the real reason in there, of course, which is that it's narrative convenience. It's so we, as the audience, know who is a changeling and who isn't when we're supposed to be able to know that. But I think you can take that and flip it a little bit and make it work as an in-universe explanation, too. Because 
Odo is the first of the changelings known to have encountered the solids in the Alpha Beta Quadrants, in, in quote-unquote our part of the galaxy. So he is the first changeling that the other changelings back on their home world in the Gamma Quadrant meet who has returned to them after living with the solids. So when they see Odo in his humanoid form with, with his Odo face, they may decide to take a version of that as their default humanoid form because Odo was the first one to do that and the first one to come back to them to show that to them. So they might have just sort of decided, okay, when we want to take a humanoid form in order to interact with solids, but we're not imitating someone and we want to make it known to everyone that they are speaking to a changeling and not a member of another species that we may be imitating, we will take a form like this. So people talking to us will know that we are a changeling assuming a humanoid form. And uh, it, it, it's for similar reasons as it was done on the show for narrative convenience because they already had that look, that aesthetic established for Odo and they said, okay, let's just make the other changelings look like this. But in universe, I think it works too because Odo was the first changeling to live predominantly among solids and that was how he looked. And yeah, they, they explained it for Odo because uh, he wasn't good at imitating faces but for the other changelings, they could have assumed that as their default humanoid form because that's how Odo looked when he was interacting in a humanoid form with other humanoids. Here's one from Bjorn 000. Was Spock really the only Vulcan in Starfleet? I think the best answer is that he wasn't, but he is the only Vulcan that we ever see in Starfleet in the original series. Uh, and I think he's the only Vulcan we see in Starfleet until we get to the movies. And uh, there is the uh, the science officer who dies in the transporter accident in Star Trek The Motion Picture, who is supposed to replace Spock. And then, of course, in Star Trek II, we see Lieutenant Savick, who is a Vulcan and is in Starfleet. Um, but up until then, Spock is the only Vulcan we actually see. So... It's, you can sort of take it by implication that he's the only Vulcan in Starfleet, or that it is very, very rare for there to be Vulcans serving in Starfleet. And certainly it's rare enough that it caused a rift between Spock and, and Sarek, because uh, Spock going into Starfleet rather than going into the Vulcan Science Academy was seen as something so unusual, if not totally unprecedented, at least very, very unusual, that it created a rift between himself and, and Sarek. But there is reference in, uh, it's, is it the, I think it's the immunity syndrome, uh, where a, a Starfleet ship, a Federation ship, I think it's the Intrepid, uh, is referred to as having a completely Vulcan crew. And presumably the crew of this Starfleet ship were in Starfleet. So if that is true, if we take that to be the case, then Spock is definitely not the only Vulcan in Starfleet, because there are at least enough Vulcans to crew an entire starship with nothing but a Vulcan crew. But in terms of what we see in the show, uh, yeah, Spock is the only Vulcan in Starfleet that we ever see during the original series. So I sometimes say that, and a lot of Star Trek fans will say that, or will sort of use that as a shorthand to describe the specialness of Spock, the, the uniqueness of Spock's position on the crew and in Starfleet. But technically speaking, uh, it's probably, it's almost certainly not the case that he was the only Vulcan in Starfleet. Uh, but for the purposes of watching the original series, you might as well say he is. Here's one from Secular Scholar. Do you think the DS9 episode, Children of Time, is an interesting commentary on the abortion debate on the pro-life side? I suppose you can read it that way. I don't think that was the intention. I certainly don't get from that episode that it is trying to tell me something or get me to think about something related to the abortion issue. But I see how you might get there because you do have that, um, that issue of if the crew escapes from the planet and avoids the accident that sends them back in time, then their descendants that they have discovered living on the planet uh, will cease to exist. So they are, in a sense, terminating the lives or, or, or cutting off the potential lives of their descendants by escaping from the planet instead of having the accident. But I feel like that's a little bit of a stretch, and I don't think that was the intention of the writers of... Um, of the episode. I do think 
there is a, 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 a tension there that is, that, that is meant to be there between doing what is best for you now and doing what would be beneficial to people in the future. And it's made a lot more, uh, a, a lot more real and a lot more pressing to the crew of the Defiant because they have those people with them right there. You know, they, they have the, they're not just hypothetical people or potential people. They're, they are real and they exist. Um, and, and that is ultimately why, uh, the, um, the, the crew makes the, the decision that it does. Remember at the end of that episode, they decide that they are going, that they are not going to make it so that those people are erased from existence. They are going to try to, to leave, uh, and, and have the accident and, and remain stranded on the planet. But it is future Odo who, who changes that and allows them to escape and erases the existence of everybody there because he doesn't want Kira to die prematurely. Um, so I think it's it's a time travel story and it's a story about uh, you know what would you if you knew that what you did if you knew that doing the right thing for you now would cause negative consequences in the future what would you do I feel like that's the central tension of the episode and that doesn't have to be an abortion question I think you you can apply it to that if you want but it never honestly I've watched that episode a bunch of times and it never occurred to me that it was possibly an allegory for the pro-life side of the abortion debate or that it had anything intentional to say about the abortion question at all. I think you can read it that way, but I, that's not how I read it, and I don't think that is the intention of that story. This one is from Maddie Jeanson. You were doing so well until you called Odo a daddy. Star Trek is ruined. Please excuse me. I have to burn my eyes. All right, look, Maddie, I don't know wh where you are on terms of the, the sexual orientation spectrum. I don't know where your proclivities happen to lie. I am a hetero guy, so normally I'm not into dudes that way. But facts are facts, and face it. Just, just face it. Just, let's, let's, let's not even waste time arguing about it, okay? Future Odo is a daddy. Look at him. Look at him. Future Odo is a daddy. Look at the face, the, the, the weathered but handsome face. Look at the clothes with the shirt, the, the tunic open just a little bit. Look, the, come on. Come on, I'm not saying you have to personally be into him. If, you, if, if that's not your thing, that's fine. I Look, he, it's not my thing either, right? I, I'm, I don't happen to, to, to go for dudes. But if I did, right? Come on. Daddy. Daddy. I'm sorry that you find it upsetting, but daddy. Daddy. These next several comments are from my DC Fontana video, but this first one pertains to Odo in response to me uh, announcing that Odo would be the subject of a future video. It's from Dr. Ness Prophet, who says, how did someone like Odo become a high-ranking officer? He was drafted. Ah, bring in the mash joke. See, I mentioned that in the Odo video, but this comment was left before that Odo video was uh, produced. So yeah, as, as many of you may know, René Auberginois appears in the movie of M.A.S.H., the original M.A.S.H., the Robert Altman movie, and uh, he plays Father Mulcahy, and that is one of his lines in the movie. So I think they refer, are they referring to Hawkeye? I think it's been a long time since I saw M.A.S.H. the movie, but someone refers to Hawkeye, I think, and they say, how did a so-and-so like that ever get to be a high-ranking officer in the, uh, in the Army Medical Corps? And, and Father Mulcahy, Rene Albergenois, says he was drafted. So, <laughs> well played. Well played. Nice mash reference. Uh, uh, Rene Albergenois, did a, he, he did several Altman movies. He was sort of part of Altman's uh, standard company of actors for a little while there. So, yeah, good, good quality mash reference. I salute you. Here's one from David T. Smith. I'm sorry she left us before I had a chance to say thank you for yesteryear. I saw it about three years before my dog, Prince, died. I, too, had to choose between him having an extended life of pain or a painless death. While I won't say that it influenced my decision, I will say that it helped me examine what I should do when that sad day happened, and by remembering the good times I had with him, it lessened my guilt for letting him go. Great tribute. Yes, uh, referring to D.C. Fontana, writer of that great 
uh, Star Trek animated episode yesterday. And you know, the euthanasia part of that episode is something that uh, the producers had to fight for. I can't remember if it was the network or if it was filmation, but somebody kind of gave them a little bit of a pushback on that. They said that having the pet, uh, having Aichaya be euthanized in the episode was too heavy for a Saturday morning cartoon, which is what Star Trek the Animated Series was. It was ostensibly produced to be watched by children. And uh, the, the, the network or the, or the company, I'm not, I'm not sure which, but somebody in the chain of, of production objected to uh, the, the euthanasia element of that. And Gene Roddenberry, to his credit, pushed back and said, no, that it's important to the story. And I think the audience, be they kids or adults, will be able to handle it and, and get the importance of it. And it makes it a better episode. So we're going to do it. And I think because of the agreement between the show's producers and, uh, or the, you know, the creative team on the show, Roddenberry and Fontana, etc., and, uh, and Filmation and the network, they, they had the, the ability to have, I don't know, it was probably not quite final cut, but they, within, within reason, they had the ability to dictate the content of the show. So the network or, or Filmation, I forget who, asked them to change the euthanasia part, and Roddenberry fought back and said, no, we're, we're keeping that in. And of course, now it is almost universally thought of as, as the best episode of the animated series. And I uh, thank you very much for sharing that, that bit of your personal life with us. I'm sure that there were a lot of people, um, especially those who first saw that show when they were young, who either had gone through the death of a pet or would later go through the death of a pet, that that, that show was probably very important to them and, uh, and letting them deal with that uh in a in a better way so yeah that's i'm sure that that probably was a really important episode for a lot of people and and it's to the credit of gene roddenberry that he insisted and made sure that that part of the episode stayed in here's one from eric noble after watching a lot of her episodes from tos i've noticed how she also maintained a sense of continuity in the series her work would make reference to previous adventures. In the deadly years, Kirk's bluff strategy from the Corbomite maneuver is used again against the Romulans. She was the first keeper of the lore. Absolutely, that is a great thing to give her credit for and very important to bring up. And now that you say it in your comment, I wish that I had mentioned it in my video because yes, and once she started doing it, other writers did that as well. They would imitate DC Fontana and make reference to things from earlier episodes. And that was so important in a show like Star Trek, the original series, because that was an old school, old fashioned American network TV drama series where it was extremely episodic other than the characters and their positions and their, and their backstories that were already set when the series began. There was very little carryover from episode to episode. There is very little character development across the series. There might be character arcs within a given episode, but not a whole lot of development large scale across the series. And DC Fontana, you're absolutely right, was one of those writers who would make little references in her scripts that alluded to events from previous episodes to remind you that this was all taking place in a cohesive world, that these events that we are watching on TV are real events in the lives of these characters, and they, 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 they are enduring, they remain in their memories, and they inform who they are going forward, which is so, so important. It's one of the most rudimentary steps of world building. And yes, D of, of all of the original Star Trek writers, I think DC Fontana was probably the first to do that and wound up being extremely important, both for establishing the world just in general and also for setting that example for future Star Trek writers that yes, this is something you can do. You can refer back to the events of previous episodes, even if it's just in a very, very minor fleeting way to establish that that stuck that that is an event that this character remembers and it, it creates this cohesive timeline in which this, these stories, these episodes take place. Absolutely. I'm, I, I, I really wish I had thought of that and mentioned that in my video, but I thank you for bringing it up because it's really, really super important. This one is from William Hostman. No, Steve, that is not a griffin, at least not in the meaning of the term as presented in heraldry. Griffins and eagle's head and talons, the body of a horse or goat, 
and the wings from the horse's back or withers, whether the front is fully eagle-like or is the head and talons separated by the forebody and upper forelimbs of the horse goat varies by time and nation a bit. Some variants are lion-bodied, but griffins are never bipeds. The rampant posture, often used for griffins, 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 generally is for quadrupeds reared up. Bipeds and merfolk generally use combatant instead and isn't indicative of bipedalism. Thank you for that, William. Speaking of important topics, um, you ever reach for a joke? Because that's what that was. I know that I, look, I, I googled griffins just to, to do a little bit of research before I put that joke into the script because I thought, oh, it looks kind of like a griffin. I wonder if there's anything there. And I googled griffins, and yeah, you're right, griffins are, are usually quadrupeds. The alien in, in that episode of Star Trek, in yesteryear actually, uh, it's not quite a griffin as we usually understand it. But you know what? I, I reached for the joke and I would do it again because I thought that was a cute bit. I like the idea. I like inserting the idea into people's heads that there's this planet in Star Trek that's full of griffins. Even if they're not technically griffins, I stand by my joke. I was reaching for a gag. You ever reach for a gag? That could be taken a couple of different ways. I think you know how I meant it. This one's from Tim R. Giving her a lot of credit when a lot of other people were involved. She was a script polisher. She originally wrote only 12% of the scripts. Nice job getting your politics into your video. <laughs> First of all, my politics are in all my videos. Like, I'm not going to try to sneak my politics into my videos. My politics are present in all of my videos because my videos are made and written and presented by me from my point of view. And they talk about things that I think are important and they talk about those issues from my perspective. So my politics are in all my videos. I'm curious, though, why you think particularly celebrating DC Fontana is an instance of me getting my politics into my video. If I had made a video celebrating Gene Kuhn, would you consider that political? Would, if I made a video celebrating David Gerald, actually David Gerald is gay, so you might consider that political if you thought I gave David Gerald too much credit, right? Uh, Bob Justman, if I made a video about Bob Justman and, and his role in Star Trek, and, I, and I, I put over how important he was, would that be political? I bet you wouldn't complain that that was political. I get the feeling that the reason you think, that the reason you resent me doing a video about DC Fontana and pointing out how important she inarguably was to Star Trek is that she was a woman and you don't like the women getting too much credit. Is that it? So, I, good job getting my politics into my video. Well, thank you very much. I will return the compliment by saying, good job getting your ignorant reactionary misogyny into your comment. And you can go fuck yourself with your, she was just a script polisher, she only wrote 12%. <laughs> Go fuck yourself. I'm pretty sure I describe in the video the nature of her contribution to the series, why it was important, what it consisted of, not just the scripts that she was the credited writer on, but her role as story editor and the number of uncredited rewrites that she did to important episodes that, that amounted in many cases not to mere script polishes, but to drafts that fundamentally transformed the nature of the story, as in her rewrite on The City on the Edge of Forever, which I'm pretty sure I mentioned in the video. I'm pretty sure I mentioned a lot of shit in the video that contradicts what you say in your bullshit comment, but you're just going to pretend that you didn't hear that or that it doesn't count because you want to be pissy about the fact that I made a video celebrating a woman's contribution to Star Trek. Go fuck yourself. Now, this next one is a recent comment that was left on a video from several months ago. It's the video I made about whether or not Star Trek Discovery is actually canon, and it's from Jack Rackin, who says, Don't disagree with the direction your beloved franchise is taking, just accept it and buy the products. I'm not going to make any theories or fuel any outrage to Discovery because doing so would be pointless and wouldn't send the proper message. I'm simply not going to give them my money. Orville's still really good and often fills the right niche while adding quite a bit of humor too, so I'm supporting that instead. And that is your right, and I have never meant to suggest that you have no choice but to just buy your CBS all-access subscription and watch Discovery 
and you're not allowed to have opinions about it. I have never said anything that I believe could be fairly interpreted as don't disagree with the direction your franchise is taking, just accept it and buy the products. If you disagree with the creative direction that Discovery is taking, that's completely within your right to do. And I don't begrudge anybody that, unless they're doing it for bullshit reasons. Like, prob I presume the guy who left the comment that I talked about right before this, where he's pissing and moaning about, I'm giving too much credit to DC Fontana because women shouldn't be writing sci-fi, or whatever the, wherever the fuck he was coming from. Uh, if you just don't like Discovery for whatever reason, you don't think it's a good show, it doesn't hold your interest, you don't like the aesthetic, you don't like the choices that the writers made, whatever, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. And I'm not saying that if you have those objections that you're not allowed to say anything. Of course, you can write about it and talk about it and make videos about it and do whatever you want. I've said very critical things about Star Trek Voyager in the past. And I've said critical things about other versions of Star Trek that I like a lot more, but just happen to think maybe they made a wrong turn here or there, or, or certain things they did didn't work or didn't turn out so well. It's completely fine to be critical of media you love. In fact, it is vital to be critical of media you love. I think that's very, very important. And it's very, very important for people on the internet to make and for others who watch it to see examples of media criticism that comes from a place of love, that comes from a place of generally liking the thing being criticized or, or believing it to be important, but still critiquing it and criticizing it and analyzing it. I think that's very important for people to see that criticism does not just consist of hate and trolling and talking shit about things and describing how much you think something sucks. That media analysis and critique can be constructive, right? I feel like that's very important. So I've never, ever, ever intended to send the message that people who don't like Discovery should just shut up about their critiques and just be happy and watch the show and not say anything and never question creative decisions or anything like that. That video was about people who make up bullshit conspiracy theories because they dislike the show so much that they feel compelled to fabricate scenarios where the show just doesn't exist, where the show doesn't count. It's not part of canon. It's not the same thing as this other thing. That's what I object to. And even that, people have every right to do it. It's just bullshit. It's completely made up bullshit with no basis in fact. And that's what that video was about. So yeah, if you want to critique Discovery for not being a good show or for because you don't like it for whatever reason, be my guest. It's not, it's not, it's not up to me to tell you whether you can do it or not anyway, but if you're interested in what I think about it, I have no problem with anybody doing that. But if they hate on it because of their own prejudice and bigotry and ignorance and small-mindedness or they feel compelled to spread bullshit made up conspiracy theories. Yeah, I'm not gonna be okay with that. Now these next few comments are on my Damar video. This first one comes from Wooga, who says Deep Space Nine, nicely done. And there's a reply to that comment as well, which reads from John Previtt, I did not see that coming. Quality punning, quality punning from both of you. Thank you very much for sharing that with everyone in the comment section and for allowing me to share it with all the viewers. This one is from Moi Deeps. The only thing I might point out about Damar's sense of morality that differs from in real life Nazis, in real life Nazis existed in a world where they could have known better, where the slide into atrocity was fairly quick. Damar existed in a society that was steeped in this for centuries. His whole education, familial experience, everything reinforced the idea that what they were doing was right. That kind of deep indoctrinal framing is a crazy thing, and while I don't know if it makes Damar redeemable, it's a huge contributing factor that I think is worth considering. That's a good point, and I agree with you, it is worth considering, uh, but I would also add this as a counterpoint that I think also needs to be considered, which is just because Damar was raised in that society, just because the, the Cardassian Union regime that was responsible for the occupation of Bajor and was the fascist state that dominated the Cardassian system and the Cardassian Empire was in place for a lot longer than the Third Reich was in place. That doesn't mean that it was impossible for people on Cardassia to get that there was something wrong with it. And we even see indications in Deep Space Nine that there are Cardassians on Cardassia 
who get that there's something wrong, who, yes, have been raised in that same system, who have been indoctrinated by the same education that DeMar got that enabled him to think everything was great until he realized it wasn't relatively late in life. Um, and they still got that it was wrong. And they joined the underground, they joined rebellions against the government, or in the, in the case of the, uh, the character, the uh, Maritza character from Duet, the great episode from the first season of DS9, who goes so far as to attempt to have himself pass as a Cardassian war criminal so he can be executed as a symbolic sacrifice for the sins of Cardassia because he gets that it's wrong. He understands that it's wrong and that the sin of the occupation stains all of Cardassia, that it's not just a few people who did it, that it's, it's a crime that the entire society bears some responsibility for. Uh, so there were Cardassians who got that it was wrong, just as in the United States, where slavery was a norm for generations in the United States. But even at the height of slavery, there were Americans, North and South, mostly in the North, but in the South as well, who saw that it was wrong and who spoke out against it. So yes, your point is valid that it's, it's a much different thing to say that, you know, the, to oppose the Nazis when they rose up in relatively speaking just a few years versus someone like DeMar who lived in a society that was just like that when he was born and to be brought up in that, that is a lot of influence to have to fight against. But it's been done before. It's been done, as we've seen, by other Cardassians, and it's been done in real um, human history. And the example I use is, is slavery in the United States, where there were people who saw that it was wrong and fought against it at all points. So it's not impossible. Uh, but I take your, your point, and, and it, it is a valid thing to bring up. And it is, it's, it's, um, it's a difference between the actual Nazis and the Cardassians that is worth bringing up just to point out that it's not a perfect metaphor, you know, which is something that a lot of people have noticed. This one is from Dataport Doll. Damar was also too Shakespearean to live, from his position as the true believer who leads to the downfall of Ducat, or his ascension through the ranks attached to Ducat from his lowest point, he was always destined to have an equally dramatic end. Yeah, I agree with you. Damar is very Shakespearean. Of course, Ducat is very Shakespearean as well. Uh, a lot of Deep Space Nine you could describe in Shakespearean terms. A lot of the arcs of major characters in Deep Space Nine are quite Shakespearean and also quite classical, you know, quite tragic in a very classical sense. And I, I think Ducat would be one of those characters. Damar may also be one of those characters. Characters that just in a literary sense have a destiny, you know, and they can't escape from that destiny. They have to fulfill that destiny. And I think Damar is definitely one of those characters where, yeah, he just isn't fated to have a happy ending. Even near the end when he turns, when he leads a resistance against evil, when he becomes a champion of, of liberty and freedom, the shadows of his past deeds are so dark and so far-reaching that he just, he's never going to escape those. You know, he may find redemption at the end in death, but he's never going to find redemption in life. You know, that's just not the ending that is fated for him. And that, that's a very classical technique, a very classical concept of, of how to create and develop a character as well. And there is a lot of that in Deep Space Nine. Um, and it's definitely there in the case of Damar, for sure. This one is from Hyacinthus. I don't think Damar has to die in order to reach redemption. This just doesn't follow. Him dying does nothing for an assessment of his moral character. He had been putting his life on the line up to that point. The fact that he finally lost it does not change that he had always been making that sacrifice. I don't agree with the only good Nazi is a dead Nazi. Hitler is dead and he's still awful. No, the only good Nazi is a former Nazi turned anti-Nazi, exactly as Damar was. The man's moral worth is not the sum of all his actions, it's the character of the man he was at the moment of assessment. In this case, we're assessing Damar's character at the end of the series, and that character was undoubtedly good. 
the idea that his good actions need to balance or outweigh his evil actions in order for him to be a good person just doesn't make sense. As long as he accepts that his support of the old regime was wrong, recognizes the evil he was complicit in as evil, his moral character has changed. The fact that he then risked his life and turned a whole world on its head in order to set things right is only additional testament to the degree to which his moral character has changed. His death does nothing to supplement that because he had been willingly risking death all along just to do what he now thought was right. That's not just a good ex-Nazi. That's a good person. A better person than the vast majority of us. You're right. It is, uh, it is perhaps unfair to insist that a person cannot be reformed or cannot be redeemed unless the totality of their good actions outweighs the totality of their bad actions. In, in a way, that is a very simplistic view of, of morality and of what constitutes a good person. So I think, I think you make a good case there. I would just, by way of, of trying to explain the way I'm approaching the subject, and I mentioned this a little bit uh, uh, in my response to uh, Dataport Doll's comment, uh, where she talks about how... Uh, how Shakespearean Damar is. A lot of my assessment of Damar and whether or not he is redeemed is coming from a perspective of critical analysis and literary analysis. And to me, looking at him as a character in a story, I feel like his redemption is not complete unless he dies because the weight of his misdeeds is so heavy you know, because he is responsible for so much death and destruction and suffering, uh, for his redemption to truly take, to truly land and feel like, aha, he has, he has proven himself, he has redeemed himself, he has to give his life. Now, you make a good point about how he had been risking his life all along, so him actually dying doesn't really change anything. I think that's true, from a philosophical point of view, but from a literary point of view, from a dramatic point of view, his death brings that sacrifice, bring, brings that change home. It's the period at the end of the sentence. It establishes unequivocally that he has changed and that he is willing to make the ultimate sacrifice that he can make for the cause of righteousness that he has now pledged himself to. Yes, technically his death doesn't change anything because he was pledged to that cause and was willing to die and risking his life up to that point, but his actual death is what lands it, is what makes it, is what firms it up and establishes it as, yes, he has truly changed. Uh, and that maybe that doesn't make sense philosophically, maybe that doesn't make sense morally if we're talking about him as though he is a real person, but dramatically, uh, literarily, I think it makes a lot of sense. And that's why I say that uh, Damar dying enables him to have a level of redemption that I don't think, I certainly would not have felt that he had, uh, had he lived through the end of the series. Here's one from Carlisle the Cinephile. I just noticed the USS Actually NCC 1980 registry in the corner of the screen during your Patreon shoutouts. Is this a new thing you've added or am I just unobservant? Also, what class of ship is the Actually? It's not new. I've been using it for a while. I haven't always used it, but I'm pretty sure I've used it ever since I started using that, that sort of blue mock Elcars screen for the monitor background and also for the background of the patron shoutouts. Uh, I've, I've had that USS Actually notation in the upper corner. And yeah, it's so, it, it, but you can be forgiven for missing it. It's not right out there in your face, but it's been there for a while. And uh, what, sh what class of ship is the Actually? I would say it's gotta be a Nova class. I just love the Nova class ships. I love the way the, the design looks. I love that they're a small ship with a small crew. Um, and supposedly they are science vessels, which I think is cool. So I, it's the, the Actually, I guess it's a science vessel. It's, it's, a, it's a Nova class. Screw it. Now, these next comments are from my Star Trek Doesn't Actually Understand Evolution video. This one is from Captain Deadpool. Either the salamander babies are dead, or they permanently screw up the ecosystem of that planet. How about that for Prime Directive? Well, that's a great point, and how about that for adding that onto the list of things about evolution that make no sense 
within that episode, of course, referring to the Voyager episode Threshold, which I talk about a great deal in that evolution uh, video of Trek, actually. Yeah, it seems like once Paris has evolved into the salamander thing, or the he's on his way to evolving into the salamander thing, he feels somehow instinctively compelled to go to this planet with evolved Janeway and, and mate and reproduce. Like, but how does he know where that planet is? How does he know, even if we say, well, maybe he's just, he's not seeking that particular planet, but he's seeking a planet that meets certain specifications. Like, I mean, did he just do a scan of the, of the, the immediate area and find the planet that was the best match for what that species needed? And he went there. How did he know what the biological needs of the species he was evolving into were going to be? There's all kinds of stuff, if you think about it, that just makes the evolution aspect of it even more wrong and make even less sense than it already does. And yeah, also Chakotay says, just leave the salamander babies there, which in my joke, it was, well, they're dead, but your joke works as well that, oh, it's an invasive species. They completely disrupt the habitat of this, <laughs> this other planet. It's a, it, and Chakotay's just like, just leave them. They're this planet's problem now. Not very prime directive -y, is it? No, not at all. Here's one from Jeremy Ewing. Wow, TNG Genesis both didn't get evolution and was bizarrely anti-vax. You know, I didn't get that. I never got that from that episode, but several people have left comments on that video saying the same thing. So, and, and I, it turns out that is a somewhat commonly held opinion and a, a common uh, criticism of that episode because it is Dr. Crusher's uh, vaccination of Lieutenant Barkley that results in the, the de-evolving disease uh, that causes all the trouble. So I, again, as with um, Children of Time and the, the suggestion that it was some kind of, a, of abortion allegory, I don't think the anti-vax stuff in Genesis is intentional. But if you read it that way, I mean, you can definitely, it's definitely there. I don't think it's intentional, but you can certainly read the episode that way. And, and yeah, if I were the writer of that episode and someone had pointed that out to me before the episode was produced, if there was still time to change it, to try and mitigate that, that's certainly something I would want to change. Because I, as a writer, and I, I imagine most, if not all, of the writers of TNG would not have wanted to send a message, willfully or otherwise, that would cause people to be skeptical of vaccines. Uh, so I would have changed that if at all possible if somebody had pointed it out to me, but, but I certainly don't think it was intentional. But yeah, I, I, I see how you can get that from that episode. Here's one from Little Foot Feet. Oh my God, the lofty scientist character is genius. He's every old white popular scientist dude rolled into one. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow. Well, no, thank you, because I was actually worried when I was writing it, and then when I was shooting it, and then when I was editing it. I was really concerned that that, that wouldn't go over, that I was maybe doing too much, or that it was too obscure of an in-joke, and that people wouldn't like it. So uh, comments like this are really, really validating. I'm so glad that I made the right choice, and that, that doing that uh, Professor Honeybee character, and doing so much of him in the episode was was the right choice. So thank you very much uh, for, for validating that creative decision. It makes me feel really good. And, whew, it's a weight off my shoulders. <laughs> Here's one from Mutant Sword. This is a terrible format. Please never do this again. All right. I'm sorry. You know, actually, the, the people who complained about the Professor Honeyboy character in the video who said that they thought it went on way too long or it was too slow or, or had any number of, of objections to it, I, I do kind of see your point. There were actually parts when I was editing the video where I, I had like a George Lucas moment after that, that famous video of him after the first screening of, uh, the, of The Phantom Menace where he says, I think I may have gone too far in a few places. I kind of felt like that. But, like George Lucas, I went ahead anyway, and history will be my judge, I suppose. Here's a comment from P.Z. Myers. 
okay, you got all the evolutionary biology correct and accurately characterized a certain scientist, but you missed the key objection. If a random webcam jockey and YouTube comedian from some podunk town on the East Coast can get it right, how can a group of professional science fiction writers in Los Angeles fuck up the science so spectacularly? None of this stuff is that hard. They were getting paid to write it. They're in a big city with major universities packed with sci-fi nerds who'd be overjoyed to consult on a show like Star Trek. You'd think a science fiction writer would have some respect for the science part of the term. What went wrong? Wasn't there a single competent person familiar with some basic science anywhere on the staff who would have raised a hand and said, uh, actually, what these episodes tell us is that there is a serious flaw in the culture of the production of entertainment. It would have taken so little effort to correct these egregious misconceptions, and better science might have made for a better show, yet that effort wasn't made. That tells me that, at least in these instances, the goal of the Star Trek franchise was to churn out garbage for uncritical consumption, rather than to make quality media. I do think the, the scientific misconceptions and the, the, the wrong science in both of the episodes I talked about, and in, uh, probably in a lot of the other instances as well, would have been so easy to correct, either by just tweaking the presentation or the description of evolution, or by just attributing the cause of whatever the thing is to something other than evolution. You know, so when in, in Genesis, when the crew starts to, to mutate into other forms of life, instead of saying they're de-evolving, just come up with another term for it and don't tie it to evolution. You know, same thing with Tom Paris changing after he, uh, he goes warp 10 and comes back. You can say he's mutating, but you don't have to explicitly tie it to evolution. And that would solve a lot of those problems. But for some reason, they didn't. They decided, no, this is evolution. We're going to say this is evolution. And it's galling because that's such an easy fix. I will say, though, and this is the part where I have to speak as, as a writer and a critic and not necessarily as, as a scientist, which I am not, I do think there are times when it is legitimate to, to make a creative choice that is not scientifically accurate or, or, or a valid presentation of real science if it will result in a better story. I don't think that it is, it is incumbent on a science fiction writer to always get the science right no matter what. I think story and character has to come first, and if you have to sacrifice a little bit of scientific accuracy to get to a better point in your story, I feel like that's okay. I feel like there's not a problem doing that. But for, for things like I was talking about in that video with, with the episodes like Genesis and, and Threshold, and also the, the way the doctor, the way Dr. Phlox talks about evolution in the Enterprise episode, uh, Dear Doctor, I feel like in those instances, the departure from the science doesn't add anything to the story, and it would have been so easy to fix that. And, and it may even, as, as, as PZ suggests, it may even have resulted in a better story. So that's the part that's annoying is when it does feel like it's just lazy and sloppy, as opposed to they made a creative decision that necessitated putting the science to the side. And of course, that was the last comment, because how the hell am I going to follow a comment from noted evolutionary biologist and former pillar of the atheist community who was excommunicated because he was too supportive of women and marginalized people, P.Z. Myers. Right, I'm not going to top that. So and thank you very much, PZ, for for leaving that comment and for for just watching and commenting on my shit just in general. I, I seriously, that means a lot to me. Um, so yeah, that's it for the comment response videos. Thank you all so so much for the comments and uh, enabling me to make cheap, easy, lazy videos like this every couple of months because content is king. Ha <laughs> ha. Mwah. You don't get any of the money. I do not share it with you. Um, speaking of which, though, if you want to help me to continue to produce videos like these, you can go to patreon.com slash Steve Shives and become a patron of this channel for as little as $1 a month. $5 a month gets you a shout out at the end of a future Trek Actually video. A pledge of $1 a month or more, a pledge of any amount, lets you vote in uh, polls that determine topics of future uh, regulation Trek Actually videos. Those are the ones that I script and actually try to make good in stuff. Basically the exact opposite of this. And um, yeah, so if, if you like what I do here on YouTube, maybe consider helping out as a Patreon patron because it, it, it's what enables me to keep doing 
what I do. And I thank those of you who have helped me to continue doing that. Uh, also, I want to remind you, if you like the Star Trek stuff that I do, that I also co-host a Star Trek themed comedy podcast called The Ensign's Log, where myself and the great Jason Harding play characters who are low-ranking officers stationed aboard a certain famous Federation starship as it embarks on a certain historic five-year mission. I think you see where I'm going with this. We are nearing the end of our second season, and many of you who do listen to The Ensign's Log or have listened to it up to this point uh, have been very complimentary and, and have really seemed to like the show. We really, really appreciate that. It is so much fun for us to do. If you enjoy Star Trek, if you enjoy sci-fi comedy, and uh, you want to listen to what we humbly would say is a pretty good podcast, listen to the Ensign's Log. It is linked in the description of this video. You can listen on SoundCloud, you can listen on the website, you can listen via RSS using your favorite podcast app. All the links are in the description. Check out the Ensign's Log. Thank you so much for checking out this video. I'll be back in a couple of weeks with another Trek Actually video. The next subject of a regulation Trek Actually is uh, going to be why the ending of Star Trek Enterprise was actually the worst ending ever. Uh, so that'll be a fun video. And uh, until then, Happy New Year once again. Take care, everybody. And I will see you next time.